On this week's episode of 90 Degrees, we are joined by So Money, creator at the Hammer Betting Network. You can find his work on the Edgework HQ YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about NHL, CFL, and the stigma around being a professional sports better. Let's dive into the sharp side and look at the right angles in sports bet. Big bomb bomb bangers. Boogie Ladies down. and gentlemen. Bangers. Jews and Gentiles. Bangers. Sharps bangers. and squares. Bomb. You're now tuned into episode 19 of 90 Degrees, where we give you the right sports betting angles. Today's guest is So Money. He is from BC, British Columbia, home of the best bud, from what I hear, swollen members, and of course, So Money. So, So Money, thanks for joining us. Tell us about how you fit into the betting space. Well, thank you for uh, for having me on. I'm very uh, very excited to be here, and I'm very impressed that uh, that you started off there with uh, with a uh, swollen members. That's uh, that's not, I, I I don't hear that too much. So that's that's re- that's very impressive. I uh, my story is not um, it's not typical in the sense that I never had anybody kind of guiding me along or like um or 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 like a father who would like watch sports and like I got into it and stuff like that it would it was never like that for me it was mostly um kind kind of by fluke um I uh we as as an immigrant family um like the story goes that the parents have to work all day so um so after school we were kind of left to our own devices um I also grew up in like a pretty tough tough neighborhood low income tough neighborhood so um there was a lot of situations where either after school you you're outside hanging with kind of getting in with the wrong crowd or um in my case you come home turn on sports center and or watch them say by the bell and then you're just uh you're just watching watching sports all day so that's that's how it started with me i just started watching sports all day um just watched everything that was all i did after school until the parents came home at like six seven uh talked for a bit did you see out of trouble today yes go to sleep uh listen to the radio uh sports talk on the radio wake up and do it all over again so um those were kind of my like humble beginnings and where where sports betting came in was that um just just from the course of watching um i placed my first bet um we had the parlay cards uh for like the local local government so um you place like three four five team parlays um so i did that for two three dollars when i was 12 13 years old uh we had a hookup with a guy who would who would just um, put it in for us even though we were we were underage um he would do it through his uh like he owned like a like a convenience store and then there was a kiosk in his convenience store and that's that's how we got the hook up there so it it basically started from there um i always lost but it was more so um i thought i was smart right and like you that's that's how it starts with like a lot of people you think you know sports you think that well i'm watching the game i know what's going on so um and then from there i actually worked for a major sports book who had their customer service um kind of area based out of Vancouver. And that's when it really struck me that I was able to look at the flow of money coming in. I was, I can see it now, but um, I used to flag winning accounts. And um, I used to look at not only what they were betting, but it got to a point where I was kind of uh, deconstructing the type of bets they were making. And that's where um, it kind of took it to the next level for me. And I was also some of the contacts I made through my employment with them, um, have endured to, to this very day. So, um, that's kind of where we went from being a 12, 13 year old know-it-all to, um, really trying to, um, analyze and take it to the next step. So was this like all sports you were betting or did you have like a focus? No, at at that time I was betting everything, right? So, um, yeah, and um, I would watch NFL on Sundays. Um, and then it's funny they had um, it was called odd set. So like it would be like um, you pick all twelve, thirteen games, and then um, as long as it would it was either 
um, a win when your team wins by more than four or the other side by more than four, or if the game lands within three, then it's considered a tie. So you go through the 13, 12, 13 games, whatever there were at the time, and then you um, and, and, and then you pick your side. So um, I would do that every week thinking that I'm like ultra sharp and like I can like nail the, like the 12, 13 at a time. And one time I did, right? I did hit the 12, but but it was like everyone else did as well. It was a very it was a very square week that week, right? Um, and then everyone else did. So like even though I won all 12 games, my share on like a five dollar ticket was like twelve dollars and fifty cents or something, right? Because like So wait, this is like the racetrack where the payout is based on if everybody else wins or not? Yeah. Exactly. And it's not, you know, like one on one with a sports book where no. they have yeah. to pay you an amount. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean like like it just goes to show like like where we started, right? Like I I thought that was like that was like the way to go. Yeah, I mean, now for these cards where you have to like base it on the margin of victory, did you ever compare the cards to the market price being offered on the single game bets? And did you also ever look at the key numbers? Not at that time, right? Um at 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 that time when I first started, it was just um, I didn't even know about about anything offshore, so I would just go walk in and like place my five bucks and like and like and like I'm good to go. Um, it's a different story now. Um, we have we have access to um, our uh, BC like the like the BC equivalent and like in Toronto the pro line. So like we have access to all that where we can kind of kind of compare to what's happening in the offshore market and um, if they're on moving us slowly. So it's a uh, it's a it's a different operation now, but uh, back then it was just I walk in, get the card, tick off a bunch of teams that I watched last week that who I think is going to win, and put my five bucks down, and we're good to go. Yeah, what I've noticed about researching the parlay cards is that they make insane the sports books make insane profit margins on them, so that's why they they tend not to pay attention to them. Yeah. But there's a couple out there, mainly in person, where they're going to have stale lines on there. Um, there's one online sports book, not going to mention their name because I don't want them <laughs> to correct this, but if you know, you know, mm-hmm. and they will have three teamers to play plus 550, yep. which isn't normally good at the normal price. But, uh, <laughs> if you, you know, all I do is I just look at the lines being offered and I look at the alt lines and if the big free price is pays worse than minus 115 at a sharp book compared to the parlay card. I'll just put the parlay card play in, even if it's like opposite of my own opinion on the game. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the way to do it. I wish that back then I knew as much as I know now, because things were a lot different back then. And like, even, even at my age, if I was able to just uh, kind of think a little bit beyond that very elementary level, um, yeah, it could have been uh, it, it could have been very prosperous back then. I mean, you could always think of if I knew what I knew today, I could be more prosperous. Uh, and of course, you know, getting introduced to gambling, things can be much worse because people get into it and you never know if like they have some predisposed uh, gambling problem that they didn't know about. Exactly. And like, that's the, the, that's the other thing that I, that I look at too, right? Like when I started, I was what in like grade seven, right? So like all throughout my like early high school years, I was like betting, but I was betting two, two, three, four, five dollars a game, right? So like, um, and I was losing. A couple loonies and toonies. Exactly. Yeah. A couple loonies and toonies, right? And, and like, and like I was losing, right? So like my, my tuition in this game was paid for by very small amounts looking back at it. Yeah, um, which is always good. Now, you were doing NFL for a while. What made you kind of shift away from it and move to other markets? So I, I kind of had like like an epiphany. You can say like about maybe four or five years ago. So um, I still bet the NFL. Um, I still bet everything, but I don't originate everything, right? So um, for the NFL, I work with I. I, I work with partners and what I realized is that I can in in my partnerships and in people that I work with, I can bring more to the table when 
And I think this goes in all areas of life where if you are specialized in certain areas, you can bring more to the table in, in a collaborative team environment than if you try to do everything yourself. So that's, um, so that's the reason why I shifted away from uh, kind of making my own NFL numbers, making my own college football numbers. And I've left that to the other side of the partnerships where, where, where they take that, we, we pool our numbers, we kind of get what we need to get down. And then I'm responsible for the um, NHL side of it, the CFL side of it and, and uh, women's tennis. Women's tennis. I knew about those other two sports. Didn't know about the women's tennis. Now, what made you get bit by that bug? I I, I actually enjoy the game a lot more. So, um, like in in terms of like, there's in in like men's tennis, it's it's all predicated on the serve, right? If you have a strong serve, um, it's it's more likely that you're gonna that that you're going to win and that and and the points that you gain on the serve or whether or not you have a good return game and whether you can break the other person um that is what's going to be co- um, kind of correlated in, into the odds so it's in in that sense it's 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 very linear in the women's game it's a lot more volatile you don't have you don't have the same dominant service players you have um you have players that can that are strong in the return game, but you have to make the determination that are they actually strong returners or are they playing against individuals who are poor at serving? And there's a lot more, uh, because there's a lot more breaks in the women's game, it lends itself to a more, more, more volatile kind of, um, kind of situation. And as betters, you want volatility, you want chaos, because that is when you can kind of determine your edge if everything is kind of laid out the way it is in like the men's game, all eyes, everybody is seeing the same thing in the women's game. That is when you can kind of dig deeper and see that um, what is actually happening here because everything is chaotic. And um, that's the, that's the reason why I, I was drawn into the women's game. And um, I, I love watching the women's game. I think that it's a, I'm not going to say it's a better quality product, but it's a, it's, it's, it's better in terms of, um, it's it's more unpredictable in the in the conventional sense than it is on the men's side. Now, with the volatility, are there any sort of alternate markets that you bet on to take advantage of that volatility? Not not that much. Um, I think that um, for me, um, there is enough you know volatility for me in like the main markets and like and like and and like tennis is like a huge worldwide market so like there's no there's no issues with 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 liquidity either for the for the most part so um i don't really delve into the into the derivatives that much um i'm i i i mainly focus on the um on like the sides for 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 women's tennis i mean there's so many different betting angles when you focus on volatility like college football bowl season uh, this last year, FanDuel was the only sports book that got it in terms of the alternate lines selling points. They were making sure that for bowl games, if you sell points, you get a smaller payout than the regular season. The other books are just treating it like a regular game, um, including one one book that was offering seven-point reverses on totals and spreads, two-teamers, plus 850. Wow, look at that. They paused it for one day. I'm like, oh my God, did they realize? And then next day it was back. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's so funny, right? There's like the, there's like a lot of these these like situations where you 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 kind of think that like, do they know what they're doing and and they're doing this intentionally to get people in? Or like, do they just have no idea or do they not have enough eyes on these things or what the they probably have on? a high profit margin to be honest yeah totally yeah they're like okay who cares if this guy is winning this market yeah. we make such a killing on yeah absolutely that's my that's guess true. yeah um, i can see that but you used to work for the sports books so maybe you would have some better theories on that um you know like the college football thing too you know i had my own theory and i used to bet on it for years about you know betting alternate lines and then finally once i had some math sense into me i I got the past scores, looked at the standard deviations. Sure enough, 
the standard deviation on college football spreads and totals is larger in bowl season than any week, including the first week of the season, where you don't know anything about these teams. Right. Right. Yeah. And and like I wonder how much um how how much the information goes goes into that too, right? Like um bowl season there's it's a lot more it's a lot more in more informational based as well. So that would be something else to like keep in mind as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, up until I came with that strategy, I was never good at Ben and Bowls. And once I realized I need to stop being rational, had some more <laughs> <Yeah>. success. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You know, it's not like NFL at the end of the season when you're playing a teaser and the lines are much more accurate. Mm-hmm. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. You have two teams that are glad to be in the Bahamas and you don't, you can't really factor in which is the team that shows up and which one doesn't. Now, I brought you on for the hockey uh, for part of it because hockey is a popular sport. Lots of people love betting on it. I know nothing about betting on it. I do appreciate watching it. Uh, what are some like basic things that people should look for in hockey? Um, you know, cause I know about, uh, goalie setups and power plays. Like, you know, if someone is from Mars and they're learning about sports betting, what would you tell them about hockey? So the very first thing I would tell someone is that know your goaltenders. And, and the reason for that is that, um, besides star players, um, there's, there's nothing that impacts the market more than um, if there's a surprise, if there's a surprise in the market in terms of who's going to be starting in goal. Um, we saw that even this morning, the Rangers, uh, for for example, the beat writer went back and forth about um, who's who's going to be starting in goal for them. And you saw that massive fluctuation in the market because there's a big perceived difference between the Rangers starting goaltender and their backup. Now, I don't think it's that big of a difference in terms of what the in terms of what the market thinks. There there is a difference, but there's always an overreaction. So if you can um if you can value your goaltenders to a point where you have you have a rating system and you can kind of determine that okay, just because this guy is the backup doesn't mean that the market needs to react this much. And the flames, for example, is 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 a perfect scenario of that where for the last couple of years their backup goaltender as whenever he's announced um the market fades him and um and he's he's not that bad in fact um i would argue that this year he is the better option than 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 what the flames have in goal right now so um the first step i would advise anybody is to know your goaltenders um second step would be um, the star players impact the market as well. So, if you can, if you can determine um, who is going to impact that line, then that's another way you can kind of um, kind of figure out that who is who is who is driving that line and who is um, who should not be. Yet the yet the market is still moving. Yeah, I mean, that's like what struck me about hockey is that like baseball, the pitcher is the biggest variable that changes the team's line game to game. Hockey is goalie. And uh, at thegameday.com where I work, I do a lot of, you know, futures content where I simulate a playoff series and they asked me to do Stanley Cup. And I said, yeah, I can program it. Just got to talk to some hockey people, make sure I got the right stuff in there. And from there, I came up with a system where like, and I worked with Zach Pitcher on this. Uh, he was a previous guest. Uh, he comes out with his own hockey power ratings as well as NFL. And, you know, I, can't, I, I asked him questions about what he thinks each team's goalie strategy is going to be for the playoffs. Are they going to have the same goalie play every game? Are they going to rely on a backup? Um, and one of the biggest things we found last year was with the Rangers, the, the drop-off between Shesterkin and whoever's backup is, I don't remember the name, um, was so large, but in the playoffs, they were going to rely on only Shesterkin. So that changed the power rating. And then, you know, when building the simulation, I had it where for whatever probability the backup plays, it would select the backup team, the, the backup goalie power rating for the team. And if it takes a starter, it takes a starting goalie power rating. And then based on that, can come up with a simulation on how often that team wins the game. Um, 
And, you know, to my shock, after putting all this together of all the futures models I've ever put together, not only did it have like the lowest edges in the market, which is always a good sign when modeling, but it had really good closing line value. Like I, I would put the bets in at the beginning of the playoffs and the time the puck drops, it's actually a worse price than what I bet it at. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and like, there's also like the, the, like the school of thought as well, that, that, that like the goaltenders don't matter at all. Right. Like you can, you can have, um, um, goaltenders who at any singular event can play well or they may not play well so um just just don't worry about them there's there's that school of thought as well i don't subscribe to that notion i think that um that obviously like how i mentioned that i think that goaltenders are are like the biggest thing that you should be looking at um but 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 that also leads me to like the point where um we are in the last couple of years we have moved to a more uh, more a player level um, where um, in the sense that like it's really difficult to beat the market if you have if you have um, t- your your ratings are only based on team level if you can get more granular to like a player level focus I think you'll have more success beating the market and that's how you were saying with like building that building that futures model where if you're able to incorporate the goaltenders that's 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 a very granular player level um, aspect of it and I think that that would um, that would lead to more success in today's NHL market than it would in like the last couple of years where you can kind of make make power rankings for for a team on like a on like a holistic level if I want to measure the impact of replacing another defenseman with another defenseman mm-hmm. uh, what sort of statistics would I look at to figure out how that affects a team's win probability so de- defensemen are are pretty interesting because you have um, it. It depends if you're classifying them as a as as an offensive defenseman or a defensive defenseman, right? So so someone who is an offensive defenseman, you want to look at what their what their expected goals would be, um, how much they're like contributing in terms of um, like the like the possession like the possession metrics of the team. Are they um, do they have power play time? If you take them out of their lineup, who is getting those power play minutes? Is the team still going to be um, able to generate the same expected goals when he's when when he's not playing, or like do their possession metrics drop when he's not playing? And then conversely, you look at a defensive defenseman. I'll I'll give an example on the Flames, um, who I'm really high on, Chris Tanev. Um, he is not a household name, but what he does is that when he's in the lineup. He slots everybody to where they should be in terms of their allocated minutes. He is um, he can match up with the other team's top uh, t- top line. He's um, he's a rugged shutdown kind of c- kind of defenseman. Um, he's never going to show up on on the on the score sheet that much. But when you take him out of the lineup, um, you need to focus on um, who else is getting those minutes. And now, if you have a situation where he's your kind of only shut down defenseman and now you're bringing in someone else to take those minutes while well, they're not going to shut it down as much. So now you have to adjust for um, how much that increases um, the opponent's expected goals. And then from that expected goals, um, that's like the difference in the, ex- in the, in, in the expected goals is where you would generate your win probability. That sounds awesome. Um are you able to like get these insights from looking at play by play data? Yeah, so there are um so with 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 getting the data, um there are private models that um that a lot of the league and like and like the media have have access to. There's also public models that 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 are that are available as well. Um what I would caution with the public models these days is that um everybody has access to them right so you have your you have your public facing sites where people build their models based on those sites but if everybody is doing it um and everybody is basing their numbers on the same data um where is your edge right so um i think that if you're able to kind of get more robust play-by-play data um, either through what the league has given access to to the teams and the uh, 
and some of the beat writers, I think that that would be the the better way to go about it. Yeah, this is really good stuff. Now, let's say you're somebody who doesn't mind betting on stuff that isn't as fun to watch and you're into hockey and you decide to do one of these European hockey leagues that has less attention. Um, you know, is there room for winning if you can scrape um, the play by play data and come up with your own uh, power ratings for certain situations based on that? I think so. Absolutely. I think that um, I, I always look at a market in terms of like how many eyes are on that market. Right. So if you look at something like um, I know there's a betting market for the AHL. I know there's um, there's some books that have um, junior hockey markets. Right. Now, the problem with those kind of things is that uh, because there's less eyes, there's also less opportunity to get the data you would need um, to to build a proper model that can beat the markets. Right. So um, if you do have access to um, to those play by play data, um, hit me up first. And then, um, and then, and then build your models. I mean, I'm just tempted to hit you up after the show and, and talk about, you know, building a scraper to scrape some of these, <laughs> these web pages. Um, I know I've done it for Asian baseball where they don't have publicly listed, um, you know, stats. So I just, you know, scrape it and I can figure out, you know, certain dimensions of a ballpark. And, you know, I still can't say a single word of Mandarin. But I certainly know how to get the computer to read it. There you go. Yeah. And I it's 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 so fun because there's like and and it's challenging as well, right? There's like so many so so many different ways to like go about it. And like I'm not the strongest in terms of like scraping data or like even like data analytics. Like it's not it's it's not my strong suit, but I've I've learned enough where I can do enough and the things that I can't do um, I do have people that I can rely on who can who can help me and who can kind of guide me up to that next level for things that I'm not good enough to do. Yeah, and I'll let you in on a secret is that, you know, I'm not one of these Python data scrapers that can be, really scrape the web really well. I just use a Google add-on called Data Miner that's free. And I'll take some trial and error to make your own recipes, but usually it does the trick. You just have to make sure it grabs yeah, and, the right thing from each section. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's great. Right. Like, 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 like a lot of times with, with these things, like it is, it is trial and error. Right. And like, as long as you are, you are comfortable with failing, um, the one time that you do get it right. Um, like that's like, that's golden. And I think that's sports betting in general, because there's not a sports betting university. Uh, you don't graduate high yeah. school, go to college and learn sports betting. A lot of this, you have a problem, you figure out, okay, how do I solve this problem? And step by step, you build up your arsenal of skills uh, to build things, and then you network and meet other people. Absolutely. And I think that that's where your kind of education in this in, in this field comes from, right? It's like, and I, and I often see this, like anyone can just go out and say that I like this team, I I. I, this is my pick, right? But um, even if it's like, like the amount doesn't matter, but whatever skin you have in the game, that is when you're really going to learn. Because when you lose money that you've put on, um, that is when that, that education kicks in. And again, the amount doesn't even matter. It can be like $1, I don't care. But when you have something on the game, that is when, when, when it really matters. Yeah, that's like one of my pet peeves is when these sports betting influencers talk about betting tons of money that most people don't have on these games. If you're not betting the money I'm betting on, then you don't know shit. It's just kind of like bravado. And then the real heads know that like the real winners are complete nerds. Exactly. And they're not the, the, they're thing, not the ones in good shape hanging out at the pool at Circa for the most part. Yeah. Totally, totally, right, and like it's a, it just like drives me nuts sometimes as well. But I mean, that's that that's the way that like the industry is right now, right? Like if you, but I am comforted with um with with the fact that I think that there is a middle ground of um of people that understand what it actually takes, and there's there's people who are also willing to learn, um to kind of get to kind of get to a certain point, and 
we're for the most part able to uh, see kind of see see through all that bullshit. So I think that um, I I am comforted by that, even though there's just so much garbage I see every day. Yep, it's just like mining for gold. You got to sift through the garbage, just like you sift through the gold. Now, our shared interest is actually in Canadian football. Because uh, oddly enough, in New Jersey, I'm a huge CFL fan. I'm only a recent convert. But as soon as I got into the league, I was hooked. So like, why don't you just tell our listeners about um, how you fell in love with CFL and how you started becoming a, how you became a winning better? So in the in in the CFL, I started with the CFL just um, pretty much how I started hockey. I just I had more exposure to it living in Canada. Um, it it was on TV. We started watching um, when when I was watch when I first started watching CFL um, was when Doug Flutie was on the BC Lions, right? So um, it was a very exciting time um, and. And and the city, you're older than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I started watching CFL. I thought would you would have been, been late thirties. I I am late thirties. Right, so oh, so you started at a really young age then. Really young age, yeah, yeah. Like 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 I'm talking like like five, six, seven years old. Oh, I started wow. watching the CFL. Right. So um, yeah, and then and, and then at at that time, um, the city embraced the team. Um, and there was more, there was more excitement in the CFL. Um, and I, I mean, over the years, the NFL with, um, has like kind of taken over in terms of fan, in terms of fan interest. But, um, I started with the CFL when there was a lot more excitement. Doug Flutie was doing his thing. There was a lot of great players that as a young kid, they just, they just kind of spoke to me, right? Like it, guys, like, like you would know, like, like, like Don Narcisse and like Ray Elgard and like. Right, like those don't know those any of these players. guys. I'm a recent convert, <laughs> I mean, like I said. Yeah, yeah, I, I I'm like those are. Doug the Flutie, I only know because he won a Heisman. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right, so like those are the kind of players that like kind of drew me to the to, to the league, and um, I I just started watching over the years. Um, my my kind of fan fandom turned into something that just like every other sport has turned into something that maybe I can make mo- make money off it. And the CFL is actually perfect because there's not, there, there are enough eyes on it to have liquidity, but it's also not big enough where, um, where, where there aren't any edges, like um, for the most part, like for, for example, in the, in the NFL, you generally need to bet early in the NFL, but in the CFL, um, those edges kind of stay longer throughout the week. The lines don't move as quickly. Um, you have time to like go through the practice practice reports and kind of really analyze what they mean. Where um, whereas in the NFL, you don't have time. Like you you need to know what every player means, and you need to be able to move on that quickly. I also think it's a great sport for casual bettors because there's only nine teams and they play once a week. So you don't have to be following every day like baseball. And if it's nine teams, you can really research them. A lot of these teams, well, I think all the teams play each other more than once during the season. So, you know, you get a lot of familiarity with each other. Uh, another plus I would say is with the line shopping, especially with tools like BetStamp, is you can get an extra point or point and a half. And because of the increase in two point conversions, because of the 20 yard end zone and the increase in rouges, um, well, not increase, but rouges in general, you have fewer games decided by three and seven. So the difference between five and six and four and five is much bigger in the CFL than college or NFL. Uh, Three and seven are still important. Uh, Most of what I found is once you get beyond seven, the points don't matter as much. But anything between zero and seven is really important. And Absolutely. As a fan, I love it because most of the games come down to the final three minutes. Yeah. And you have a situation, I think it was, it was last year there was a game where I, I forgot the under I had. But um, 
the score was tied at 23. So the under I had was 47 and a half. And you think, oh, my bet had lost. It's tied at 23. Well, the game at the game ending play was a rouge. Toronto, Montreal. So, yeah, Toronto, Montreal. You just been on that game too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you were on the total, but I just like couldn't believe that you could win yeah, it under and- with it. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah, it like the I find that the CFL like obviously they're not they're not ever going to be as big as the NFL, right? So what you need to do is kind of gear it towards um towards the fan experience and how do you hook fans in, right? Like you you need to have an exciting product on the field. Well, what is an exciting product? Airing it out, having having games come down to the wire, right? So like a lot of um a lot of rules that have been implemented in the CFL have been geared towards that. If you have a team that's up 14 in the last three minutes of a CFL game, the game is not over, right? Because not only are there just Unless three Unless it's the Edmonton Elks that are playing. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't. But the, yeah, yeah, because like n- 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 not only are there three downs instead of four, but also the clock stops as well, right? So like... Um, so so you can't just run it down like like how you can in the NFL. Um, the other thing too, um, and just to circle back to like the um, betting aspect of it when you were talking about the um, about kind of like the like the key numbers that aren't as relevant in the CFL as they are in the NFL. Uh, if you can find books that um, that um, kind of price the key numbers in the CFL in the same way that they would in an NFL game, um, there's an edge there as well, right? So you could um, find a minus three and a half that is priced like an NFL three and a half. But as we know, um, three and a half and the three doesn't mean the same thing in the CFL than it does in the NFL. Yeah, and it gets crazy too when they price the alternate lines just like the NFL. Yeah. Or exactly. there's one book that has 28 cent lines, which yeah. is, of course, is awful for you as a better. But the alternate lines are like amazing if you're buying points. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, or even if they allow CFL teasers. CFL teasers, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's yeah, just, there's... it's just insane. Yeah. And, yeah, and like I would, um, I've, I've like recommended that to people who are getting into the CFL that like, just have your NFL odds screen up, have your CFL odds screen up, and look at the difference. If things are being priced the same across the board, then you know that there are certain things you can do to like gain that advantage. Yeah, and like what I noticed with those alternate lines too is it's usually not until game day when they're posted. So I'll get in on the op- on the opener, but then I'll wait to see. Okay, if things move or things stay the same, what are the alternates going to be? Um, but it's certainly, you know, it's going to evolve as there's more Canadians in the legal sports betting space because uh, you guys have had the lottery, but now you have single game betting depending on your province. Uh, I know Ontario is the big Kahuna right now. Uh, we'll see what happens out west. Um, big thing I've noticed too with the CFL is that it's really big out West and then in the big metropolitan areas, uh, minus Vancouver. So basically Montreal, Toronto, it's not very popular. Now, BC had some issues getting fan interest, but they have this new owner that has, has gotten the fans engaged. Um, I think the big problem is the Toronto owner just like doesn't care about the CFL. Yeah, I and I think that 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 Toronto's proximity to the big U.S. cities also plays plays a role in that too, right? Like you have, and um, Toronto also has the Blue Jays, they have the Raptors, um, the uh, MLS team in Toronto. There's um, oh, the Leafs, of course, right? So like, there's there, there's a lot more options in in Toronto than any other part of, than any other parts of Canada. Um, also because they're so close to like New York, Detroit, Philadelphia, they have, um, they have, the NFL is more of an influence there. Um, in Vancouver, the reason a lot of people don't care about the CFL in Vancouver is because people generally in Vancouver don't care about much, right? Like it's a very, 
it's it's a very laid back city like California like, of the north is the impression I get yeah yeah and then you have like you 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 even have apathy now towards the uh to, to towards the Canucks as well now granted it has to do with like with like ownership and like there's a lot of issues there but um yeah I I think that in like the heartland of Canada like the CFL is massive and then like Toronto um there's a lot more to do um Montreal is slowly starting to kind of generate that fan base although Montreal sometimes runs runs into that problem as well when when they don't have good teams and then um Vancouver's ownership um hopefully with the BC Lions that uh, kind of turns it around a bit I mean I think you know Edmonton which was the worst team last year I don't care if they didn't have the worst record they were the worst team yeah, yeah. uh I'll argue that all day yeah, they had the, they had the second best attendance in the league I believe yeah yeah there you go um, Edmonton Calgary um although I, I believe Calgary's numbers have struggled a bit the last couple of years um but but relative to the rest of the league it's still strong obviously Saskatchewan um it's just strong uh and Winnipeg is strong but um I think the league is on the right track to kind of um kind of can kind of get the big cities on board. I don't know if Toronto's ever going to work out at this point. Um, I mean, it's just one of those things where um, maybe it's just been, it, it's just too far gone. Like the Argos won the Grey Cup last year and like there's still not that same kind of buzz, right? So um, I don't know if Toronto's ever going to work out, but I think it's the the Argos gonna... fans truly know that Winnipeg was the best last year. Well, yeah, yeah there you go, right? So yeah. <laughs> Um, although I had the Argos in the Grey Cup, so like, so like that was nice. But uh, um, yeah, I, I I don't know if if Toronto's ever going to work out in the CFL, but the league is on the right track with the uh, with the uh, with the other cities there. I mean, I almost think like if you're a hardcore Argos fan and the Argos ever moved out of Toronto, they would just drive the forty minutes to Hamilton. Yeah, but maybe those exactly. are fighting words. Yeah, <laughs> or even take a trip to Ottawa. Although yeah. that's a bit more of a drive. Exactly. And like, and like, um, Hamilton is another example of like, even though they're in Ontario, um, they still have a very strong fan base. Right. And like, I think that even though you're calling it fighting, fighting words, I think you're onto something, right. That like, um, who, who are the hardcore Argos fans anyways, right. Like if you are a hardcore CFL fan in, 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 in Ontario, you were probably initiated as a, as a Hamilton Tiger Cats fan in the first place. Right. So um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, I've just laughed that out here in New Jersey. I'm a Saskatchewan Rough Riders uh, shareholder how, and fan. But you know what? I thought, okay, happen? I had to pick a team because I'm so into the CFL. And I'm like, which one can I publicly buy into? So I picked so Saskatchewan. Uh, so, so I'm actually talking someday I have to, to visit owner. So we actually have a CFL owner here. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Saskatchewan Rough Riders shareholder. Awesome. So I'll be in the bar, be like, check me out. I own a CFL team. That's I'll show them the ownership card. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Love it. Or, you know, I'll wear my Saskatchewan Rough Rider gear around town. People, someone asked me, like, the other day if I work for the CFL. And I was That's at a so bar. That's so funny. Yeah. It says wearing my Rough Rider hat and my Rough Rider polo. Well, it's it's also impressive that it, that in a bar in in New Jersey they were able to like pick out that you were wearing Rough Riders gear. Yeah, I was shocked. Um, so, you know, it's weird they've done such a bad job marketing mm -hmm. because like it's weird probably for other people with me being obsessed with CFL, but like if it, if it was on TV more, if the yeah. entertainment at the games was geared to, uh, towards the younger demographic better. Because frankly, they're focused too much on country music. Yeah. Uh, like if they did have swollen members perform at the Grey Cup. Oh come on, that would be like a that would be sold out. I mean, I was like looking at the past Grey Cup performers, and the only one that I thought would have been lit, and I watched the video, was Nelly Furtado and Socrates in 2006. I mean, that set was just nothing but big bomb bangers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's been like the big criticism of the league as well, right? It's a very... but it's like only like less than half of the games are televised on ESPN nationally. The yeah. others, if you're in the states, you have to watch on ESPN Plus. 
So I can't even walk onto a bar and ask him to put it on. And 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 like that's like something that I don't understand with like in like in like today's world that everything that you want to watch in terms of sports should be readily available to you if you really want that game to grow. And and the CFL is no is no exception. I find that it's a very um it's it's it it's a much older fan base. And at some point, if you're not able to um, kind of recruit the younger fan base, where where, where are you going as a league? And um, I think that um, here in BC, um, like just from like a local perspective, they are actually doing a good job of like getting more younger fans in with like their concerts. And like um, they have set up um, um, kind of situations where like people across BC can like get rides into the game and stuff. Like the owner has like arranged shuttles into the game and stuff like that. Like like accessibility, both in terms of f- uh, physically getting into the stadium and accessibility in terms of being able to watch it on TV whenever you want is what is going to build exposure in your product. Yeah, and I think it works great that there, you only have one CFL game on at once because there's four games a week at most so they can spread it out. So if you're a fan of the CFL, you never miss a minute. Totally. Totally. And like, I would, I I would even argue that like they can maybe even go the next step and have like one designated day, right? Like um, Friday probably doesn't work. You don't want to do it on Sunday um, unless if it's, well, you, you, you could do it on Sunday from like um, June to like September right and then like have like a saturday where you have like this is this day is for the cfl yeah you know what's the busiest time of the year betting wise for you oh busiest time would be from the start of the nhl season because there's a lot more work to do um like in the early in the season in the in the nhl so from October to probably January would be the busiest for me um, in terms of like my own work. Um, And then, um, so like right now, um, most of the NHL work, like in terms of like a broader level, it's, it's done. Um, Teams are who they are at this point. You're not, you're, you're not going to change your DNA at this point of the season. Um, there is day-to-day work that needs to be done. Um, and that, that, that also becomes less and less as the year goes on because you kind of pick up on the coaching tendencies. You kind of know what the, what the coach's game plan for the season was in terms of how they're going to rotate the goaltenders. So, um, from now, um, onwards, the NHL work becomes less. So I would say that starting in October, becomes the be, becomes the busiest time for me now like in terms of like each day when do you usually start and when do you usually finish because i think you would have an advantage of being in the west coast because even though you have to wake up a bit earlier you're, you're not finishing at 1 a.m yeah so i often joke that in the in the mornings when i wake up i wish i was on the east coast and then at night when i'm going to sleep i'm totally fine being on the west coast right um so my so like I'll give so like today's Friday. Um, there's a big slate of NHL games tomorrow, right? So, um, so my work on tomorrow's card um, starts um, a couple of hours ago with with kind of practice and news that's coming in for the teams that are in action tomorrow. Now it's just something that um, I I make note of with 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 what's happening. So I don't get too deep into into tomorrow's card um at night time um after today's games are done um and depending on like the family schedule and what's like going on around the house and stuff if i'm able to get everything done um in the evening um like like closing the books on that evening's games i would like to do that tonight right so everything all of friday's games when they're done they're finished tonight now if there's like stuff with like the family and like there's like plans and stuff um it may not get done on on on, in in the evening so that means saturday morning i have to wake up super early right so 
um, sat, so like the, so like the game days, um, I'll wake up at about five 30, right. Cause the limits go up around six 30, seven o'clock. So at five 30, I'll be up, um, to kind of make sure that I've got everything in order, um, for who's starting, who my projected goalies are and all that. Um, but if I didn't close the books the night before, then I'll probably be up at like 4.30, 4.45 just to close last night's books and then start on the on the next day's work. And then from there, um, the morning skates start at about 7.15, 7.30 a.m. my time. Um, so that's when I'm kind of um, looking at the news, looking at what impact that the market has. That's, that's kind of when I'm starting betting, right? So from 6.30 onwards is when I start betting. Um, the final uh, morning skate is usually usually done by about 11.30 or uh, 11, 11.30 my time. Um, and from there, like the markets have settled, right? Any, any movement after that um, is generally not news related. So like I do have an eye on it, but it's not something I'm watching very closely. And then um, once we get into the pregame skates, um, which start about half an hour before the before the game time then i'm on the clock again where i'm kind of looking if there's any like surprises of like what's going on and like um like who is moving the market at at like 15 minutes before a game what does that mean so then i'm back at it again that sounds very exhausting uh, how often do you take days off how often do i take days off um yeah so it depends so um what I used to get upset with the NHL when they had schedules of like, you have two games one day, you have 12 games the next day, and then two games the day after. I actually love it now, and I prefer it that way because I know exactly when my heavy days are going to be. I know there's a lot of games on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So I can kind of plan my week ahead of time, right? And like um, with my wife and my kids and stuff, like like we kind of know that – Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday mornings are very heavy for me. And then the other days, right, like I can um, um, kind of work, work around the family schedule on that day, because um, like, like, for example, today in the NHL on Friday, there's four games. Usually on a Friday, there's like two games. On Wednesday, there was two games, right? So like, when I'm working through that, when I see the weekly schedule coming up, I know that Wednesday morning, when there's two games, I don't really need to be up at 5.30 to work on two games, right? Like, so, so, so like, that's how I can kind of like plan out my schedule and like balance everything with like, with like home life and all that. So that's, so I think that with the NHL going to this new schedule, um, it's, it's, it works a lot better for me. Yeah. And I'm, you know, from what I gather, I'm guessing that the summer is a really good time for you. Because not only is it not rain season in Vancouver, you get some sunshine, but you know, it's CFL and women's tennis. So it's not going to be every day. Uh, Do you ever sometimes wish that you had a nine to five? Uh, I don't. Um, So, so one thing about me too, is that like, I have a lot of interests outside of the sports betting space. Right. So like I do a lot of, um, a lot of consulting work for like, for like other, for like in like a, in like a different area as well. Right. So like outside of sports betting. And the reason I do that is because a couple of reasons. So like, number one, I've got a passion for it. Um, Number two, um, I've seen kind of what happens when to a lot of people, when sports betting and um, kind of consumes you, every single day of the year for over the course of many, many years. Um, And that's kind of not where I envision myself. That's not where I want to be, right? Part of, part of like the legacy that I want to leave behind. um, And I mean, like, as you get older, I kind of think about like how my kids will look at me when like I'm older and stuff, right? Like a lot of it has to do with, I don't want them to, kind of see me as what happens to a lot of people when they've spent their whole life grinding at grinding at sports. 
Now there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like, like if like, that's what people want to do, it's totally fine. Um, it's not something that, that like works for me. There's also, um, in, in, in Canada, your, your, your betting winnings, they're not taxed, but, um, if it's shown that you, um, run a betting business, which they classify as you spend more time than a reasonable person, um, researching and betting on sports, you are going to be considered as running a betting business and you'll be taxed accordingly on that as if it were a regular business. So the reason Which I do other nuts things nuts because is, the only way to be successful at sports betting is to spend more time than a reasonable person. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so like there's, there's you have to be um, obsessive. You have to yeah. be nuts basically. Totally. Yeah. Right. I'm so nuts like, and I admit it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we all are to an extent, right? Like, like I, I don't think, um, you can be successful betting on sports without having a little bit of crazy in you. Right. Like, and I, like, I think that we're all like that. So there's a lot, there's, there's a tax element. There's like the, there's like the family um, element to it. There's also a social benefit as well. Like, unfortunately there's still this, there's still the stigma that we have when, um, like I go to my wife's Christmas party, what do you do? I'm a, I'm a sports better. Right. Well, I mean, like, do I want to talk about that? Right. Like, or like, do I just let them think that I'm some sort of degenerate or like, you know, it really sucks, but like, that's the way it is. Or I take my son to a birthday party. Or you can tell him you're a sports programmer. Or yeah, it's a sports programmer, right? Yeah. That I think that'd be the way to go. Or like I go to my son's birthday party. Right. And like, um, or, or like my son's friend's birthday party and like, like the parents are there. Right. So like, I don't, I'm always cognizant of, um, I don't want to take any opportunities away in with like, in terms of like the stigma in like society today from my kids or, um, have anything that is going to, um, be derogatory towards my family on, on that front. I would think of things a lot differently if it was just me, right? And like, I just had myself to worry about, then I really wouldn't care, right? But um, I mean, as I've grown older, like there's a legacy I want to leave. There's um, like, there's, there's, there's a lot of things outside of just making sure that everybody's okay financially that, um, that, that I want to leave behind. And, and if, and I think that the stuff I do outside of sports betting allows me to kind of be more present today for, for my kids. All right. I could talk to you all day, but I'm guessing that's all the time that we have for today. Are there any last words you have for the 90 degrees audience? Just, um, you know, there's, I would just say that there's no, there's no easy way in sports betting, right? Like you have to, you have to pay your dues. You have to work hard, um, as, as, especially now when we see there's like so many like snake oil salesmen. There's just so much garbage and fluff out there. Like, um, reach out to people that you respect in the industry. Um, there's tons of people, right? Like even on the Hammer Betting Network. Like even with like, um, like there's just so many people that you can reach out to utilize those resources. There's, I found in my life that people who are at a level where they are successful, like if they're proper and like, if they're really successful, they have no problem helping out other people. And I found that in the sports betting space as well. If you reach out earnestly and really seek help there, we're out there to help you. Yeah, I've noticed that too, that the people that are the big media personalities that aren't the the nerds, I would say, are a little standoffish when you try and reach out to them. Yeah. But the people that are in the nitty gritty of the stuff you have to be obsessive about, doesn't matter how big of a following they have. Um, you message them on Twitter, like myself and others, they'll message you back. Rob Bizzola, his DMs yeah. are open. Yours are open. Um, you know, because the only way you can't like be on your own island. No. You have to work with people with different skill sets. I mean, someone in my betting group was talking about his theory on the Super Bowl that the opening kickoff won't be a touchback 
because they're using these special balls that they're after the ball is used, they're going to store it so they can donate to somewhere and that he thinks the other team will be antsy and they're going to run it back. And I'm like, okay, this guy spent all this time thinking about this one single bet. It is a vet with thousands of bets. It's complete, you know, that's something I would have known about. And then I'll contribute some simulations I did on field goals um, for four hours. I've probably, I could have worked for more on it. Um, you know, it's just like everybody helping each other out. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I'm a big proponent of that as well. Like if, if you have, um, I always feel that in a group, if you can, everybody brings their own own specialization to the table, you all work together. That means you can grow together. That means you can all make money together. And I think that um, that's, that's, that's always been very important to me. All right. That's a wrap for today. Stay tuned for episode 20 next week. Big bomb, bomb, bangers. Boogie down. Thank you for tuning in to 90 Degrees, presented by the Hammer Betting Network. Head over to our website, thehammer.bet, for all your sports betting needs. If you've enjoyed the show, click that like button. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. If you've made it this far, drop a comment on your favorite NHL betting angle or even your favorite CFL betting angle. Let's catch.